So thank you all again, thank, and thanks for being here and welcome. Um, my name is Jose Vergara. If you don't know me, I teach Russian uh, language and literature culture at Bryn Mawr College. Um, and it's a real delight and an honor and pleasure to, to welcome our guest today. Um, I'll say a little bit uh, about that in a second, uh, but I also wanted to thank our sponsors, um, uh, namely the 360 program at Bryn Mawr College, uh, the Environmental Studies program, BICO, uh, so Bryn Mawr and Haverford, and uh, the Russian department here at Bryn Mawr as well. Um, this is a talk that's kind of part of a series, part of a, a group of presentations and conversations and, and lectures about climate, about environmental, ecological issues and, and such topics. Um, and uh, linked to a number of different classes and different um, efforts on campus. So um, it's wonderful to, to have you here, Glenn. Um, as, as you know, um, I included your, I guess your first essay on Celestalgia in uh, the course I'm teaching this semester on environmental, uh, ecological, excuse me, displacement in Russophone literature. And it's such a nice and useful uh, productive lens to uh, to frame some of the things we're reading. So it's exciting to, to have you here and to learn more. Um, as Sydney Record points out, another one of these classes that's engaging with your work um, is uh, in the biology department and environmental studies at, at Bryn Mawr. And one of these boxes represents 24 eager students. So um, we have a great audience here. Um, so a few words on our guest, Glenn Albrecht is an honorary associate in the School of Geosciences at the University of Sydney. He retired as professor of sustainability at Murdoch University in mid 2014 and continues to work as an environmental philosopher. Um, he published Earth Emotions with Cornell University Press in 2019. Um, and this book was translated into French and Spanish in 2020. In numerous publications and talks over the last two decades, Dr. Albrecht has developed the theme of uh, psycho uh psyche earth, or negative and pos positive emotional states connected to the state of the earth. Uh, new concepts developed by him are now becoming well established and um, uh, used in the international scholarly literature, new research theses, and uh, within the arts, so spreading in many directions. He currently lives at Wallaby Farm uh, in New South Wales, and he describes himself as a pharmosopher combining thinking and writing with growing food and protecting uh, a haven for wildlife. And while he's best known for creating the co concept of solastalgia about which we'll hear today, his most recent work is focused on the uh, symbiocene, a future state where humans reintegrate with the rest of nature. Um, so once again, thank you so much for joining us, especially so early uh, in, in the future on, on Saturday. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. It's, it's wonderful to be with you all. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's dawn here at Wallaby Farm in rural New South Wales. So it does feel a little strange to be uh, on a Saturday morning while you're on your Friday afternoon. But such are the times that we live in, we can connect instantly. And uh, hopefully this will, will make uh, our, our connection well and truly worthwhile. Um, I'm a philosopher by training and inclination, so uh, much of what I've got to say will be informed by my, my background in uh, philosophy and the social sciences. Uh, I'm also a transdisciplinary thinker, so you'll find me regularly transgressing into other people's domains. And that's largely because I see the world through the lens of complexity and, uh, and process. So rather than uh, having comfortable compartments and divisions, I tend to, to look for connections. And, and, and the theme of interconnectedness is one that's dominated my thinking right from very early on in my career. In fact, my, my PhD thesis was on organicism in idealist uh, philosophy. Uh, Hegel and other idealists were, uh, were certainly well known for their process philosophy and the, the study or the philosophy of, uh, of interconnections. Uh, I grew up as a nature boy in Perth in Western Australia, and that also explains to some extent my ongoing interest as an adult in 
the human relationship to life and nature, uh, our part within it, uh, its part within us. And it's, uh, it's been a journey that I call my sumbiography, where the, the sumbios, the S-U-M-B-I-O-S, from uh, the, the Greek it means uh, uh, living together to, to cohabit in a sense. And it's the root word for symbiosis, uh, a science created in the 19th century uh, to explain the interrelationships and, and the living together of unlike uh, species in the same place. So this symbiography that I have sees me as a, a nature boy growing up in a world that is becoming in, increasingly complex, increasingly risky, uh, to the point now where as a nearly 69-year-old, I uh, have lived long enough to see that uh, we're, we're in a, a really precarious point in our history where tipping points, whatever you want to call them, can push us in so many different directions. Many of them are incredibly dangerous and risky for humans and unfortunately for uh, other species, other living beings on this planet as well. So I'd like to, to run through this, uh, this talk with you using some slides uh, in a PowerPoint which uh, hopefully give you an image of what it is that I think about because uh, some of you may never have visited a coal mine or a power station or places that have inspired me to write about solastalgia and, uh, and I'll explain this as I go. So I'll share my screen and we'll see if we can get going. Um, all right, so hopefully, uh, you can now see a title slide. Is that is that right? Yes. <laughs> this is very sophisticated for me. Uh, so what I was uh, attempting to say uh, a minute ago was that we now live in the Anthropocene. Uh, now, I know that it can be controversial to define uh, particular periods in the Earth's history and there's still a lot of debate and discussion about the appropriateness of the term Anthropocene, but the way I see it, it's, it's, a, it's as much a cultural uh, and political concept as it is a geological one, that this period of human dominance is one that uh, we, we can see uh, you know, before our very eyes with respect to issues like climate change and species extinction. But I'm also interested in the way that uh, humans have impacted on themselves from a psychological, emotional uh, perspective. So as a philosopher, of course, I'm interested in the science of the, the biophysical because I see it as crucial to um, the, this relationship between uh, humans and the biophysical landscape. But at the same time, my focus is always on, well, what's going on in our heads? What, how, how are we feeling? What's the relationship uh, is it changing over time? <clears throat> Excuse me. So the Anthropocene is a, is a concept that uh, makes more sense uh, towards the end of my talk when I start to shift from a discussion of the negative impacts of these changes that humans themselves have wrought on their home environments, their regions, their continents, their, the whole planet. Uh, and I will move towards this concept that, uh, that Jose mentioned briefly about the, the symbiocene, the, the next period, because I, I'm talking about the future of solastalgia and you, you might be surprised that uh, where I'd like the future of solastalgia to go. So this is me standing on a bridge overlooking the coal that's coming out of the Hunter Valley and the empty uh, carriages going back into the valley. Uh, and this is the location of the site where I began this work on, uh, which we, we're going to discuss under the name Solastalgia. Um, being a bird person, I was interested in going into this region to, to look at some of the history of Australian ornithology from colonial times. Uh, the uh, famous British ornithologist, John Gould and his equally famous wife, Elizabeth, were based in this valley in 1839-40. And, uh, having an interest in the history of ornithology, I wanted to go and look at where they lived. 
for a period of time. And to get there, you had to go through this valley, which is full of uh, Permian coal, uh, coal mines, power stations. And to me, uh, thinking back on it, I probably had this feeling that this is the Anthropocene. This is where humans are at the moment, this dominance of uh, the, their industrial and technological powers over the rest of nature was on show for everyone to see. The Goulds had written about the Hunter Valley as like the Tuscany of the South, a place full of birds and beautiful rolling landscapes, rainforests full of amazing creatures like lyrebirds. And I was expecting uh, in, the, uh, in the 20th century, as it, uh, as it was then in the early 21st century, for the landscape to still have elements of that beauty and of elements of that uh, biological richness and what I found instead were uh, hundreds of square kilometers of this. This is one of the big open cut uh, coal mines in the Upper Hunter. In the background is Bayswater Power Station. If you look carefully, uh, you'll see little tiny objects, but that's one of the largest uh, caterpillar bulldozers in the world. Uh, that little object there is one of the world's largest trucks. And inside these mines are uh, giant shovels or electric shovels that take out the soil and, and, uh, and deposit it in these large flat top hills. And then they blow up the coal and then take it uh, off to the power stations. And via that coal, uh, coal train that you saw earlier to the port of Newcastle, which is the world's largest exporting port for black coal, and then off to the power stations and steelworks of the world. Now that to me represents the Anthropocene. Uh, it's a landscape that's so brutalized by human technology and industry that it's not recognizable uh, um, to anybody who uh, has been in this part of the world, even in the last 100 years. And certainly for the indigenous people, the Wanarua people whose land this uh, area uh, sits, uh, the coal mines and the power stations are on Wanarua land, um, it, it's an in indescribable sadness that they feel when they see what's happened to their home country. And I'll say more about that uh, specifically in a, in a few minutes. But this gives you an idea of what it is that I confronted as a um, philosopher, thinker, bird loving, nature loving uh, person just entering an environment that was the opposite of that which I was expecting. My mind was still in 1839, 1840, but my reality in the early 2000s was that which you see in front of you. So this relationship between earth distress and human distress was instantly triggered when I saw that landscape and what had happened to it. I wanted to know more about this relationship between the, the sort of distress that humans have uh, specifically connected to their, their home environment or their home their region. And I started reading uh, what I could uh, from the perspective of a philosopher and I guess somebody who's looking at it through the eyes of natural history. And the, in the um, literature that I had available to me in the early 2000s, <clears throat> there's very little that I could find that seemed to cover this specific form of distress that humans feel related to the, uh, the, the desolation of their home environment, their biophysical environment. And it didn't matter whether it was built or natural, both uh, landscapes seem to be equally capable of causing uh, a huge amount of distress in people. And I thought about distress. I mean, that's a, a very useful word, but it's so general. There are thousands, if not millions of things that can cause distress to humans. Why don't we have a category of, uh, of thought, of, uh, of emotional and psychological well-being that's connected to the, you know, the quite specific distress that people feel when their support environment, their home environment is being changed in ways that they find negative. Uh, there were some people who were interested in these issues. One of them was an Australian writer by the name of Aline Mitchell. And she wrote a book called Soil and Civilization in 1946. Uh, and uh, 
in it, she, she made the connection between the loss of uh, a healthy human spirit or mind uh, in the face of a, the loss of a landscape that's being um, uh, desolated by things like overclearing, erosion, the loss of the vitality of the soil is connected to the loss of the vitality of the human spirit. And there were, uh, and, at, and around the same time, Aldo Leopold in, in the United States was writing uh, uh, on similar themes that uh, the loss of ecosystem health is also connected to the loss of human physical and mental health. And he wrote about sick landscapes and sick people. So we've known about that connection for a long time. However, uh, it, it seemed to me that there was, uh, particularly in the English-based languages or language, that there was just something missing, and I needed to address that point. And before I talk about solastalgia, I have to mention nostalgia, which is one of the words that I thought about to describe this melancholia or sadness or distress that people feel. Obviously, I looked at that very carefully, and um, it comes from the Swiss physician Johannes Hoffer and work on his dissertation, which was, I think, uh, 1688 or somewhere around there, uh, where he created the term nostalgia to describe the intense form of distress and sadness that people feel when they're absent from home and wish to return. So it was what I call psychotratic. It was a, an emotion, a state of mind connected to the relationship that you have to your home, but it was specifically connected to uh, a form of homesickness or melancholia that people felt when they were absent from home and wished to return. I was dealing with people who are home, but their home was leaving them in a sense. Uh, so it was the opposite experience, but it was still a form of melancholia that seemed to me to be very close to what I felt when I witnessed the Anthropocene in the Upper Hunter. It was also matched by what other people who lived in that area directly confronting the coal mines, like neighbours to coal mines, neighbours to the power stations. They also described this form of uh, melancholia, this sadness, this distress. So it seemed to me that nostalgia was a good uh, base from which to build a new concept <clears throat> in the English language that described that specific form of distress that is connected uh, to the experience of negative transformation or desolation of your home environment. And because these people were either indigenous uh, and hence uh, tens of thousands of years of connection to that place, that home, what indigenous people in English call country, they don't by, mean by that nation state, what they mean is their place, their, their region, their bioregion, their cultural region. So the indigenous people and the colonists were equally feeling this form of distress connected to the, to the destruction of the landscape, their home, literally around them. And the, the experience is lived because it happens every day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. These coal mines and the power stations never shut down. And so uh, I thought this is a very intense feeling it deserved a name of its own. And so this is where the term solastalgia uh, was created. And I've, I did al I always wanted a bumper sticker version. So I created it and it's the homesickness you have when you're still at home. So you can get that on, on the bumper sticker of your car if you wanted to. So I'll say more about the origins of the term in a, se in a second, but uh, it has a history and uh, the, it was in 2003 that I began to think about this issue and I was working mainly uh, in the context of uh, a philosopher working in the context of environmental science and management. I was teaching environmental ethics to environmental science students. I was teaching sustainability and its, uh, its policies. I was also very interested in the concept of ecosystem health as a unifying transdisciplinary theme for uh, bringing together uh, social sciences <clears throat> and the biological or natural sciences 
uh, where I was working at the University of Newcastle. So Solastalgia had its origins at the University of Newcastle while I was working in that context. Um, I, talk, I gave a talk on it at the EcoHealth Conference in Montreal in 2003. So it actually had an international debut in the year that I created it. And then it took a while to get something published because when you come up with something new, uh, something that nobody has seen before, there's all sorts of not necessarily hostility, but um, you know, the, the, there's skepticism that it's needed. There's incredulity. Do you actually seriously want to have a, a word that looks and sounds like that? Um, one, one person very early on said solastalgia sounded like a bad case of sunburn. So you get criticism straight away. Um, and I wrote a short, um, wasn't even an essay, it was a note for the journal called PAN, Philosophy, Activism and Nature. And they wrote back to me after I sent them the note saying, look, this is really interesting. Can you write it up in a more considered form as an article? And I said, well, I haven't done that, but I'll, I'll do what I can. So a year or so later, I think it took a year and a half before it finally got through um, peer review and, and then finally into the journal. So don't ever ex expect things to happen quickly if you have uh, uh, anything that looks like an original idea in academia, it's, it's bound to, uh, to be resisted. Um, anyway, it was published. I was on sabbatical leave in Canada in 2006 and I, I wrote another short piece for the journal Alternatives. And that one, uh, strangely enough, made the connection between environmental change and pandemics. Uh, uh, the SARS uh, virus was going through um, the world at that time. Uh, there were problems with um, uh, mad cow disease. Um, there were other diseases that were running through Europe and, and North America at the time. And it was obviously changing the relationship that people have to their home environment. Um, Animals were being culled, people were being um, um, isolated. Uh, we had uh, the HIV, um, HIV AIDS uh, pandemic happening as well. So I actually wrote about solastalgia in, connected, in connection to uh, epidemics and pandemics. So I have to say that I was ahead of the pack on that one, but uh, in 2006, very few people were interested. And then in 2007, I co-authored an article which is in Australasian psychiatry on solastalgia. And that one, I guess, has been the most uh, widely read and, and received article that uh, I and others have written about solastalgia. Uh, it seems to be um, still the go-to journal that people want to read when they want to know something about solastalgia. Very, about half the number go to the original article that I wrote in PAN. So it may be because this Australasian psychiatry has more uh, brownie point stars in the world of journals than the obscure philosophically inclined journal pan, but I'll leave you to make that judgment for yourself. So the definition of solastalgia, it, it's based on solace, of course, on desolation, nostalgia, and the, the, the term alger, which uh, is uh, sometimes connected to uh, pain in the medical world, but it's also a word that's connected to sorrow. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a second. So I thought solace was an important concept in this, uh, in this uh, creation of, of the new term, because it, if you lose solace, you're losing the thing that your home environment gave you. You love your home environment, somebody uh, starts to, to change it or attack it in some way. It's that loss of solace that uh, is, is a critical aspect of what it is that you find distressing. It's connected to uh, the provision of comfort, the provision of consolation. Uh, so it's also a term that can apply to both humans and the environment. So um, you can get solace from your human companions. You can get solace from an environment that um, you find particularly comforting. And of course, the word desolation uh, is closely connected to what I 
wanted as well. So the devastation, feelings of devastation, deprivation of comfort, abandonment, loneliness, and I also include powerlessness as part of um, my original definition of solastalgia. So solace and desolation are critical, as is nostalgia. Nostos means uh, to return home in the, uh, in the Greek. So that's the, uh, uh, I wanted a home uh, reference embedded in the new concept. And finally, alger. Well, I was a bit naive about alger because um, I had understood alger to be connected to pain, sorrow, and grief. And there are, in the Greek, there are three forms of alger. Um, pain, grief, and sorrow. And so I, I didn't think that it was purely connected to any kind of biomedical condition, even though I was writing in the context of human health. I, I saw health in terms of uh, a, um, a transdisciplinary domain impacted by many things. So it, it never occurred to me that people would interpret uh, any use of alger as purely biomedical, but they did. So that, that was something that I should have thought through more carefully when, uh, when I first wrote. Uh, so there's the elements that come together for the neologism solastalgia. So there's solace, desolation, uh, nostalgia itself, uh, and the word algil, which I think is most closely connected to psychological pain and the, uh, the pain of grief and the sadness uh, of sorrow. And so uh, as long as you remember that, that that's my intention, even though you, know, you probably in literature read about the intentionalist fallacy. Well, uh, I had an example of it demonstrated to me with my uh, uh, construction of a word. So that, that's where it comes from. Uh, that's also where it comes from. I'm, uh, I wanted to show you, uh, the area surrounded by the, the red marker is the coal fields of the Upper Hunter. Um, this is Newcastle on the coast and Sydney to the south. And that part of uh, Australia is on the map of Australia down here. Um, I live near the city of Maitland. I live uh, in a, uh, a valley of the Hunter Valley. It's uh, um, the, the Yimang or the Patterson River. And so uh, I'm somewhat isolated from the actual desolation, the solastalgia of the Upper Hunter Valley, but I'm still involved in trying to stop the process that's making that area on Google Earth get bigger and bigger every year. And I'll say more about that in a second. But I'd, I'd like to just pause for a moment to have a sip of water and that also gives you a chance to ask a question uh, if you wanted to about the definition, the origins of solastalgia. Cindy, go for it. <laughs> First of all, welcome and thank you so much, not only for being here, but just for your work. It's an incredible um, contribution and I think for many of us, so I'm in social work and I'm in sort of a small part of social work um, internationally where we're talking more and more about place and um, assaults on place as a critical sort of assault on people. So your work has been so foundational to so many of us. I don't know if you know that, so thank you. I, I, in one sense, it's unfortunate. and In another sense, it's, it, it's good that I'm offering something that's uh, useful for you. I, um, you'll see that... Uh, as I get further and further into this talk, uh, I want to get further and further away from solastalgia. Uh, it's probably for my own psychological well-being rather than yours, but um, I'm in charge here today, so you just get what I get. No, I'm excited. I and I wanted to ask you, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to know that you're going in that direction because I'm, I'm curious about um, your critiques of it now. But you also mentioned that originally you had more of sort of an analysis of power around and powerlessness. Well, Did it's you... just that the, yeah, the, uh, the, the forces that are causing the solastalgia are multinational mining companies, state and federal governments. So for individuals to take on these people and, and even question what it is that they're doing, let alone try and put a stop to it, 
it's it's David and Goliath type metaphors. Uh, these people have literally no uh, no political power, no economic power. They're just mainly rural folk who were uh, dairy farmers, ranchers uh, on the river flats, which are very uh, fertile alluvial soil. You can grow just about anything there. So they're, they're incredibly beautiful and fertile places in that area still. Uh, part of the valley is famous for its uh, wines and its vineyards area, um, which is now uh, under assault from the expanding coal mine. So there were thoroughbred horse studs there, still, still are, but they too are under assault from the expanding mines. So the, the power uh, is gradually coming into a sharper focus where other industries are being pushed out by the coal mining, but the coal mining is it's it's billions uh, in 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 revenue. It's multinational. It's uh, some people say that uh, our government's run by coal and oil and gas uh, because they're the ones with the power and the money to influence how politics are, are shaping up. So I've always understood solastalgia to be connected to a, a primary cause, which is politics. Politics is about power. If you want to address solastalgia, you have to address the, the actual cultural cause of it, which uh, it, it's not the biophysical environment that's the cause of it. Ultimately, it's, it's the political system that allows this to take place. And if you're indigenous, then you know about the politics of place for well over 200 years now. I mean, the, uh, the neo-colonial uh, takeover, um, the, the loss of traditional lands, the, de the devastation of these traditional lands, like it's a double, uh, a double blow because there was obviously the, the frontier wars, the murder and all the rest of it that went on in the colonial period. Uh, and now there's a second wave of colonialism, which is the coal mining, but that affects everyone, but not equally. So that's a, another point that we have to make later. So yeah, that, so that, that red circle is where I entered and that's where Solastalgia came from. Uh, the power story is not within that red circle. It's, it's multinational. It's, it's part of the story that I tell in my book, Earth Emotions, which is about gigantism and the attempt to, to create a world which is based on you know, homogeneity, the, a, a single economic, cultural, political system, if you could call our current system a political system, uh, a single system that will be applied evenly, ruthlessly all over the world, no matter what the particular conditions, what particular culture, languages, uh, were there in the first place. It's, it's like a giant D10 bulldozer shaping the world into one form rather than allowing the, what, what the Hegelian in me would call unity and diversity. <laughs> All right, well, I'll keep going. I, even I don't know what's going to come up next. So being, uh, I'm also, I have a degree in geography and, um, and sociology. So I do have a social science background. My philosophy is transdisciplinary. Uh, I recognize that solastalgia as I defined it and as I understood it was a transdisciplinary concept. And fortunately for me, I was able to, uh, to talk to two of my colleagues at the University of Newcastle uh, Dr. Nick Hickenbotham and Dr. Linda Connor. Nick, a social psychologist, Linda, an anthropologist. And we thought that the three of us constituted a fairly broad section of uh, social science philosophy to look at this new concept, solastalgia. We also felt right from the beginning that it's not new. It's been felt by people for centuries, if not tens of thousands of years. It's just that in the English language, we hadn't decided that the environment was an important enough issue to, to get our, our language around it uh, uh, made more precise to get the nuances. 
So we decided that we would study the Upper Hunter as an academic exercise and we sought funding, we got some seed funding, we later got um, Australian Research Council grant, two of them, to, to do field work, to interview people in what the, uh, the environmental impact assessment language calls the, the zone of affectation. In the zone of affectation, in other words, your next door neighbour is a coal mine or a power station or a train line or a road that's being used by trucks that transport coal. So that we, we, we interviewed um, well over 100 people, key informant people, uh, community people. Uh, Nick Higginbotham, he always kind of laughingly said that uh, if I could think of something, he could measure it. That particularly if it, uh, you know, had some kind of real um, gr gravitas in the world. If, if it exists, I can think about it and philosophize about it all I like, but he, he was interested in measuring it. So he created this environmental distress scale or EDS uh, to actually come up with a way of, of convincing uh, empirically minded people that we were dealing with something that was real in, in the community. Uh, and I, you know, I'm biased, obviously, but I think he was uh, tremendously successful in doing that. So the three of us worked as a transdisciplinary team to build a knowledge base around solastalgia and environmental distress. And we did that for quite a number of years. Uh, I have to say, too, that the university, although we were getting ARC grants, the Australian Research Council grants, although we were publishing, we weren't, because, because we weren't sitting in somebody's uh, discipline hierarchy, um, our, our work wasn't really being uh, supported within the university. There was a lot of uh, quite overt hostility towards it. And so we found it difficult to just continue to do that as, as our primary uh, work. But uh, as part of our research grant, we got to uh, put aside money to have a look at the Hunter Valley from the air. And, you know, at the same time as we're interviewing people face to face, we're trying to get literally a bird's eye view of what was going on. Uh, so this is the Bengala open cut mine in the Upper Hunter. This is uh, in 2008, it's now considerably larger, but it's a, in this image, the mine is uh, uh, over a kilometer long, it's half a kilometer deep and some of the largest machinery in the world you can only see a little white speck there, but that's a uh, electric shovel. And so it's one of the largest moving machines in the world. And it's just dwarfed by the, uh, the work that's going on. While we're getting the, uh, a picture of that, we're also interviewing people. Um, we anonymize them so that their position in the community wouldn't be uh, in any way compromised. But for example, uh, Dora, I can say, was an elderly woman who had been, um, she, she was trying desperately to hang on to her house, which was next door to a mine like this. It was a historic home and her family had uh, long connections to it. But as the mine got closer, her life became intolerable. And so as we interviewed her, she said, I lost a lot of weight. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with my stomach like that. And she held her hand up with a clenched fist. What am I going to do? We're losing money. They won't listen to me. What do I do? Do I go broke? I can't sell to anybody. Nobody wants to buy my property because it's right next to the mine. What do I do? And I was a real mess. Well, this term, a real mess, uh, I mean, that sounds like Hoffa's nostalgia, but it, it, because she was at home, this became the, uh, the, the defining point for me that solastalgia was actually referring to something uh, deeply meaningful uh, within people, uh, deeply distressing, uh, and that uh, as the research continued, we found more and more people that had a story to tell, which was one of love of their home, love of their landscape, which was being obliterated by things like the Bengala Open Cup Mine. Uh, we interviewed an upper hunter indigenous man and this was a particularly compelling interview because he said something that I'd never thought about. He said he found the, um, 
the drive around these coal mines so distressing that he and his other indigenous colleagues would deliberately drive hundreds of kilometers out of their way in order not to see the mines. It was such a, a, a confrontation when, when viewing, uh, I mean, there's an open cut mine. Again, my friend, the photographer, Alan Chawner took that photo out of a helicopter. Uh, it's an open cut and that smoke that you see is actually coal uh, when it's exposed to the surface starts to burn and you get methane and gases, other gases and smoke coming directly off it. It looks like something out of Dante's Inferno and it probably is because it's such a confronting sight to see the earth being blown up, to see the, the, the actual uh, emissions of methane, carbon dioxide uh, coming out of the power stations. And you, you realize that when you're looking at it, that we're digging up the coal and exporting it and then importing it back as uh, climate change in this part of the world. It's ter terribly hot at the best of times in summer, but it also has savage droughts and the droughts are also part of the story of solastalgia. And um, I'll, uh, I'll talk about drought and solastalgia if anyone's particularly interested. But this indigenous man says that we take different routes to travel down south so that we don't have to see all the holes, all the dirt, because it makes you wild. Well, the wild, I mean, that, that's an interesting term to use, an emotive term. But I think the translation is that that's the politics of this. This is the power relationships. They, the, this man could see that his country, his home, was being blown up and dumped into a truck and burnt. And he could do nothing about it, except avoid looking at it. So it's the confrontation that is so distressing. And the mining companies know this, because what they do is, uh, from the road, they try and build these large bundles that hide the, uh, the mine from anybody looking in from, from road, roadside levels. Very few people are permitted to fly over the mines. I take um, journalists and others to the Upper Hunter to have a look at all this. And nowadays they have drones. You know, everybody's got a drone. Uh, and the, 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 the mining police are onto you almost instantly. They don't want you to look into the mines because they know what you'll see. And uh, I've worked with uh, other people who have gone out of their way to to say that, look, part of what solastalgia does is to make you look at something which you would otherwise prefer not to see. And so we can see that in documentary filmmaking. Um, Josh Fox and others have done it in the United States with, with gas. Uh, and I think it's happening all over the world now that uh, we do have the ability to look at that, look at things that we don't really wish to focus on. So on the practical side of things, um, maybe the environmental class will be pleased to know that, or maybe not, I don't know. Uh, the people who were being affected by these mines uh, took Rio Tinto to court in 2013. And I uh, was uh, I worked as a uh, pro bono expert witness for them. And we took solastalgia, their solastalgia as part of the experience of uh, the uh, of the mine on the quality of their lives, their health, their amenity. And it's it's quite a remarkable story, and I've told it briefly in Earth Emotions, my book, uh, but it's written up now as case law history because Solastalgia went to court and the senior judge of the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales agreed that Solastalgia defined in the court as loss of sense of place would, uh, was uh, in amongst the, um, you know, the biodiversity impacts, the landscape impacts, uh, health impacts. Uh, it, it was a consideration that led to uh, the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales rejecting Rio Tinto's application to ex expand the mine. 
So um, I'm at that demonstration in front of the, uh, the courthouse. It was at, uh, in the Upper Hunter at, in the town of Singleton. And they're the people that I work with uh, to try and stop the mine. Uh, so we succeeded in the Land and Environment Court. And then uh, the Rio Tinto took um, the Bol Bolga Milwardale are the two villages that are closest to the mine. Took, took their progress association back to the Supreme Court of New South Wales on technical legal grounds, and they lost there as well. So the government, and this is the politics of Solastalgia, decided that it would draft new legislation which would permit the mine to go ahead. Uh, so uh, passed the legislation. Uh, Rio Tinto then put in a new application to expand the mine. And of course, under the new law, it was approved. So we won. And Solastalgia was part of the victory of ordinary community-based people with you know, virtually no resources um, over one of the biggest mining companies in the world. So we won, but we lost. This one is more interesting because we won and we've still won. Uh, again, in 2019, Solastalgia went to court, uh, defined as uh, loss of sense of place. Uh, even the term psychotheratics is now part of uh, the judgments of the Australian court system, where, again, the same judge, the senior judge, Judge Justice Preston of the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales, decided that this new proposal for a new mine was so egregious, was uh, going to have such a negative impact on the, the town of Gloucester in New South Wales that he rejected the application. Again, the proponent of the mine has taken uh, this uh, rejection back to the courts in New South Wales. And so far, uh, every single court has rejected it, plus there's been no attempt to change the law yet again to approve that mine. They, 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 I think, have given up. So Solastalgia was part of the rejection of a coal mine in New South Wales. The other part of the coal mine that, uh, proposal that uh, the judge focused on were greenhouse gas emissions and the impact on climate change. And this case also was the first case in Australia where uh, adverse impact on the climate for future generations was a, a, a critical decision rejecting the mine. So it, it actually provides a precedent in all uh, uh, legal systems that are based on English law, which includes the United States of America. So you can see that it's complex, but <clears throat> I'm the kind of person, although a philosopher, that likes to get involved in the very thing that I'm studying. So some people would argue that perhaps that's not being objective. But when we're dealing with something which is capable of destroying people's quality of life, their amenity, and even their psychological health, literally uh, from solastalgia through to depression uh, and worse, uh, I think it's part of uh, an academic's uh, commitment to being a, a social uh, community person to, to be involved in this way. Uh, and I'm quite happy that I've helped people at Gloucester defeat a coal mine. Uh, I, I've got that on my CV now, so I'm really pleased. Um, I've also argued that the, the concept of solastalgia, as it, you know, I focused on the Hunter Valley and, and the impact locally and regionally. But in 2012, I wrote a short piece for the conversation, which I called The Age of Solastalgia, where I tried to take the concept out of the regional and local uh, domain and say, well, look, worldwide, we're now experiencing <clears throat> uh, locations, places, uh, in fact, now the whole earth as home. Um, solastalgia is a concept that is gradually getting some kind of traction because we're beginning better and better at destroying the very foundations of our own home, uh, both uh, in a geophysical sense and in a psychological sense. And it was at uh, this point that people like uh, Naomi uh, Kine and others started using solastalgia uh, internationally to describe 
uh, extractivism, uh, the, uh, the word that now describes a whole way of life, if, if you think about it, that we as a species are extracting benefits from the earth, but not putting uh, enough sufficient or anything back in to rejuvenate, to, um, to, to somehow repair the damage that we're doing. So that, again, that's a photo that I took of the Bayswater Power Station and a mine. Uh, it shows the, the scale of the in, industrial activity. Uh, but I argue now that we all live in a village called Bolga. Bolga is an Aboriginal word meaning uh, a mountain. That it doesn't matter where you are, what's going on in the coal fields of the Upper Hunter is now affecting your quality of life in Pennsylvania. It's affecting your quality of life if you are Inuit in the Arctic Circle. It's affecting your quality of life if you're uh, not human, you're uh, some other kind of uh, creature. So the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, has also accepted that solastalgia is a concept worthy of uh, inclusion into debates about uh, what the impacts of extreme weather, extreme climate. Um, there's a mental health burden that's carried by climate change impacts on people wherever. And so the IPCC is a, um, a body that puts together research from diverse sources Mental health is seen as an important component of the impacts of climate change and solastalgia has been seen as worthy of inclusion in the last decade or so of discussion of what it is that people are experiencing under the impacts of climate change. So there it goes from a village in, in the upper hunter of New South Wales to a discussion of what's happening to us, what's happening to our our mental well-being uh, at global scale. So that's a surprising turn of events for me because I was just trying to understand the distress in individual people and myself when confronted by drought and open cut coal mining. And now this concept, which didn't exist until 2003, is being used worldwide to understand the negative impacts of climate change I call it climate coalescence. Coalescence means to gradually get hotter. It's a more precise term than change, which is meaningless. So uh, climate coalescence is impacting on uh, beings all over the world. And I've also speculated that um, even though uh, we may not know what creatures other than humans experience at, at emotional levels, I agree with people like Mark Beckoff, that they do have emotions. Uh, and why not consider the fact that as their home environments change in ways that are confusing, distressing, uh, that a term like solastalgia is relevant to uh, the emotional lives of elephants or uh, other creatures that are, are being impacted by these negative changes. Uh, probably if I reflect on it, Solastalgia has had a much greater impact in culture than it has within social science, environmental science, or some of the other uh, more technical areas where I thought it, it had its place. It's had you know, a reasonable academic success. Uh, I don't pretend that it's you know, an international bestseller. Uh, if it did uh, Earth Emotions, I'd be looking forward to my next royalties check, but I know it's unlikely uh, to even buy me uh, one decent bottle of wine. One. <laughs> so that's the life of an author nowadays. Don't expect to get rich uh, on the basis of uh, novel ideas. But the one, the one area that uh, is just overwhelming in its, uh, its diversity, I guess, is the application of solastalgia to art, culture, literature, music, uh, and just about every other domain you can think of, uh, heavy metal. There is an obvious connection between solastalgia and heavy metal music, if you think about it. Um, there are quite a few bands that uh, are psychotyratic in their orientation and 
uh, solastalgic in their songwriting. Um, in Australia, we've got a pop star by the name of Missy Higgins, and she named her uh, an album in 2018, Solastalgia, which brought the concept out of academia and into the, the language that uh, ordinary Australians had to confront. You know, what solastalgia? What the bloody hell are you talking about? You know, so we uh, we we had a, an interesting one there, and again, the more I don't like the word esoteric, but a classical composer by the name of Tour uh, has written a concerto for flute and orchestra, which he named Solastalgia. And it's a, a direct reference to the fact that his home island in Europe is being <coughs> gradually changed in ways that he feels uh, are, are distressing. They're negative changes that come from climate change, uh, um, tree forest uh, removal uh, and other insults that he describes to the environment. And if you look up solastalgia and art, you'll find that there are now hundreds of exhibitions themed around solastalgia. Um, there are now um, as many going on in the world. Uh, well, there are enough going on in the world that I've lost the ability to keep track of them. So it's clearly a word that's resonated with uh, artistic people. <clears throat> and I, I'd have to say that um, in art, literature, music, solastalgia is now firmly embedded. <clears throat> so the just to ref <clears throat> excuse me to reflect for a moment, <clears throat> um, old professor has uh, what was called professor's throat too much talking over a lifetime, you end up with uh, your vocal cords being shredded. So I, I definitely can't do uh, heavy metal singing for you. So solastalgia sits within the psychotheratic spectrum, if you like. It's a spectrum, it's not a binary. It's, it sits, 1688 is where I, I started it with, with Hoffa. And I'm not going to go through all of the terms that I've listed here as negative earth emotions. You can just see that <clears throat> solastalgia sits within a range of negative uh, earth emotions that have been named in the literature by me or by others over the last 50 uh, years or so in the modern era, but obviously Hopper's older. Um, Richard Louvre with Nature Deficit Disorder. Um, various people like E.O. Wilson and Eric Fromm uh, wrote about uh, biophobia and necrophilia, uh, the love of death. Not, it's not what you think it is. Uh, at least I, I hope you didn't think that. Um, so there are an eco-anxiety, eco-paralysis. They're terms that have been used in the literature to describe how people are feeling in the face of these negative changes to, to their environment. So I can, if you have questions about any of those, we can talk about them later. Oh, and uh, Jose, you need to keep an eye on the time because um, I, I've got, I don't have a watch on me and I have no idea how long I'm taking. Um, and I'm still at it. I'm keep, I keep creating words. Uh, in my darker moments, I create words that are even worse than solastalgia. Uh, muicide, uh, an Indo-European uh, root word for uh, words like motion, emotion. Uh, the killing of our emotions, our ability to experience uh, the, particularly the negative um, impact of, say, uh, the killing of things on Earth, the, the sides. This is a, a main road not far from where I live, and they put a brand new white line down the side of the road to indicate its, its verge, and they went straight over the top of a dead bird. Well, that image to me, uh, for a start, roadkill is a solastalgic issue. But then to just uh, have so little ability to see or observe or even think for a nanosecond about the emotional impact of putting a white line straight over the top of that corpse um, struck me as the kind of image that describes how I feel sometimes. And I realized I didn't have a word for that instant feeling of, well, I won't, expletive deleted. Um, that feeling needed a word, so I created it. And a muir, 
is is a root word for um, the, the the precise direction I wanted to go in. So yeah, the the act of creating words is not finished. So maybe I should stop there for a second, and with Jose's uh, permission, if anyone does have a question, because I want to go from Muir side to the symbiocene and, and talk about the death of solastalgia, or okay. maybe the end of solastalgia. Glenn, just to check in, since you asked, we're at uh, 4 p.m. our time, 8 a.m. your time. Right. Now, when would you like me to stop? Oh, I, I mean, we're, we're engaged, we're listening, so <laughs> okay. uh, it's, it's up to you. If we're moving well, towards the end, we can you know, open up for yeah. questions afterwards. Well, I'll see if yeah. I can finish in about five or 10 minutes from now. Is, okay. How does that sound? That sounds good. All right. Uh, now, any questions about the psychotheoretic, the, the place of solastalgia, its movement from uh, my head to the IPCC? All right. And now for something completely different, as they used to say in Monty Python, and most of you are probably too young to know anything about Monty Python. However, it was a British comedy program which shifted from one skit to the next by saying, and now for something completely different. And it was. So how do we get out of the age of solastalgia? I mean, that's the connection. You're probably feeling uh, totally devastated by the Anthropocene, the desolation, the definitions, the negative side of the psychotheoretic spectrum is enough to make you want to, uh, you know, I always joke about, you know, I always need an extra glass of good red wine to cope with all this. Um, and, for, and I don't want to belittle the experience at all because uh, it's like a, a, a tsunami. It's an avalanche of, of negative psychotheoretic uh, force that is uh, pouring over us. We're not only living with that, but we're also living with the ongoing threat of nuclear annihilation, which I grew up with. So that was that's not new for me. I've I've been uh, in Australia, we'd say shit scared of that ever since I was capable of thought. But the the you know we're now seeing uh, in Europe the, the the circumstances, the situation where. Uh, thermonuclear annihilation has to come back onto the agenda. It should never have left, but it's always been there. And it's, uh, it's sharp now. It's part of that um, tsunami of worry, that tsunami of uh, anxiety that we have hanging over us. So I, I thought about this, how do we get out of the age of solastalgia? And of course, I'm not a uh, political scientist. I'm no great uh, mover and shaker when it comes to organising people. I, I don't attend town hall meetings. I'm no Murray Butcham type person who sees the solution as, uh, you know, just the spontaneous coming together of people to smash down the equivalent of the, uh, the Berlin Wall. So I thought, well, I, my contribution has to be addressing the the psychological dimensions, uh, the emotional dimensions of the human experience of this wonderful thing, place we call the Earth or Gaia, and that there must be a way of addressing the root causes of these problems without the uh, direct politics, without direct, the direct democracy that other people engage in. So I thought I needed to address the, uh, the linguistic, the conceptual issue of solastalgia and take us in a different direction. And it wasn't just because I like creating words, it's that I, in 2011, I came to the point where I didn't really want to research solastalgia any longer. I didn't want to do any further development of it. I'm quite happy for other people to do so, but that for my own mental well-being, and as a father and grandfather, I wanted to do something to, to uh, reverse the trend, the situation that I saw ourselves heading into. So again, I went to the, the root of the problem, which is symbiosis and its root term, symbios, which is uh, the Greek root, 
in the concise Oxford dictionary, it's spelt with a U and pronounced sum uh, because uh, there are problems with Greek transliteration of Y and U, and uh, I'm sure linguists can get into all that. But sumbios just means this, it's the root word living together. Um, <clears throat> uh, the idea that there is more to life than the neo-Darwinian view of competition, nature as a slaughterhouse, nature as red in tooth and claw, capitalism as a reflection of the, the way nature works, all of that sort of stuff <clears throat> seemed to me that we'd taken the wrong linguistic turn at Albuquerque somewhere and that we needed to reinvent the way we talk about our present and our future. So I use the term symbios to, do, to create a whole new set of, of concepts, including uh, my symbiography, this coming together of the elements of my life that uh, you know, drive me, almost compel me uh, to create terms that are more nuanced, that more accurately describe what it is that I think I'm feeling, and hopefully it, that will resonate with others. So the symbiocene. So I see the uh, I see it in entirely almost uh, evolutionary terms that we 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 are a product of natural evolution. We came out of a neo or not a neo a a, a, a proto symbiocene, a, a period where humans had no choice but to live in relative harmony with the rest of living things. That uh, we have gradually evolved out of that uh, primal or proto uh, symbiosis with others and have created our own culture, our own technology, our own world in a sense, which is the opposite of that which we evolved in. Ergo, why don't we evolve back into the world of life and living things that gave us our existence as a species, Homo sapiens 300,000 years ago, uh, Homo, you know, three or four billion years ago or whatever, uh, million, I should say, um, that, you know, we're a relatively new species on Earth. It was here before us. It's our job to integrate with it, not to dominate it and destroy it as we're doing uh, under the umbrella of the Anthropocene. So I figured that uh, within us, there must be an, an emotional uh, core, which is connected to life, living things, which is the opposite of the pathway that leads to solastalgia. So this idea of the symbiocene is a, is a work in progress. It's an idea that, as I said, I had in 2011 as a way of uh, bringing together uh, positive emotional connections, positive affirmations of our humanity with the rest of life. Now that looks, you know, the, crit <laughs> the critics of, of uh, PowerPoint would say that's a busy slide. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about it uh, other than to, than to say that there's more to the symbiocene than just defining it as a, a new era where we integrate with the rest of, of life. It's the obvious things that you would talk about if you were talking about reintegration, <coughs> biodegradability, uh, renewable energy, uh, re renewable resources based on your region, the eliminate of to elimination of toxic waste. I mean, who wants toxic waste in their food, their water supply, the air, um, and the repair of, uh, of, uh, of living bonds relationships between ourselves and, and other species. So these are things that we, we perhaps took for granted, but now that they're being removed, we can see what the consequences are. So this biophysical world that we're desolating has its correlates in the um, psychological and emotional world uh, where the impacts are now becoming manifestly obvious. And so, it's like, let's start to address the psychological problems with the biophysical causes, okay? If it's petroleum that's trying to force us to continue using gas and oil, then safe and socially just forms of clean and renewable energy are clearly the solution. Um, 
getting rid of toxic elements from our food chain. It's a no brainer, as they say in America, because who wants uh, materials, chemicals that are harmful to our, 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 our physical health, our, you know, I guess the, uh, the, the area that we're now focusing on is the microbiome, the bacterial world that keeps us healthy. Uh, it's a whole ecosystem within our own bodies. We're beginning to understand that the symbiocene is within us as well as without us, that uh, symbiosis uh, can be destroyed uh, internally and externally. So this idea that the Anthropocene ends when we start to address our relationship to the biophysical and that at that point, our good, positive, emotional connections to the state of the earth can, can, uh, can be revealed yet again. Uh, that's where my thinking is at the moment. So just in case you think I'm being too abstract, <coughs> these are uh, bricks made of fungi. Uh, they're capable of self-repair. Uh, so maybe the, the built environment in the future will be alive, not uh, concrete. Um, it may seem trivial, but we use a hell of a lot of coffee cups in the world at the moment or, or disposable things. Uh, you can eat these ones. I don't have any shares in BioBite, but it sounds like a good idea to me. Um, these Dutch students made a biodegradable car made of... Uh, beet sugar and, uh, and other vegetable products. So <clears throat> if you can make a car out of plants, you're doing pretty well. And this one I like, it's uh, energy. I, in fact, I see solar energy and wind energy as transition energy. Uh, the real energy that we're gonna be using in the symbiocene would be produced by life, uh, but possibly by microbes. Uh, and this is an article about uh, a, a, a demonstration of how you can power the light bulbs in your house using uh, uh, microbes in a, uh, in a biological reaction that produces electricity. Well, it seems pretty uh, crazy at the moment, but I could imagine a house full of microbes that do all sorts of good things for you, including light, um, power your, your lighting system or uh, produce uh, other forms of energy that you can use for cooking and, uh, and, and more. So it invites people who are practical to start thinking about, well, how do we get out of a system which is clearly killing us uh, metaphorically as, as well as literally uh, into a, a, another world, another way of thinking. And the reason for doing this is to give people the intellectual energy, the cultural um, energy to think about a future where they would like to be in opposition to the story of uh, collapsology, the story of, of, um, of eco-Armageddon. Uh, there are so many stories that are connected to a future which is apocalyptic, um, but very few stories that are attempting to uh, to get us to think about what a future could be like where we actually repair the, the damage that we've done and create a form of uh, technological and cultural life, which is life affirming, but doesn't require us to return to the cave or to actually exit this earth and live somewhere else like Musk and, and others would prefer us to do. You know, just kind of mess up the earth. It doesn't matter. We can just go somewhere else. And so the the colonial mentality becomes cosmic. So I think this is the future and that it's connected to the symbiocene, but importantly, it's about how we relate to our emotional choreography as well, how, how our emotional well-being is, is dependent on this move. Um, I won't say anything more about that. But... So the positive earth emotions that I want to end with, uh, that I argue that we have we used to have these positive relationships to the earth for free. And we didn't need to talk about them or perhaps even name them because they were so plentiful. They satisfied the principle of plenitude. There was so much of them that we didn't even have to fight to go and have a look at the sunset or to enjoy a walk on the beach without pollution. It was there always for us. 
And so I argue that the entry into the symbiocene will be the key. And this is just a quick glimpse of the sorts of positive emotions that I see as being connected to the opposite of the Anthropocene. Topophilia, uh, the uh, geographer Tuan created that concept about 40 years ago, maybe longer, means love of place. It's the opposite of solastalgia. So you can only have solastalgia if you have topophilia. And biophilia, again, um, uh, from the uh, neo-Freudian psychologist. Um, endomophilia is one that I've created, which is the love of what that which is locally distinctive uh, in your place that, uh, that's unique to where you live. Solophilia is the politics of working with other people to protect the places that you love. And UT area is one that I created to describe a good earth feeling, um, you know, the equivalent of what surfers feel when they go through the perfect wave, uh, the oceanic experience as described by Christians and, and Freud, believe it or not, the, the idea that um, we are at, at one with uh, the environment. Uh, there is no division between the internal and the external. So the short story at the end of, of, of Earth Emotions, my book, I argue for the, the loss of the concept of solastalgia from our language. So I've created it in order to destroy it. It's a perfect kind of um, Hollywood theme. The, the symbiocene is not just a, a nice idea that it actually uh, requires of us to move into a different state, uh, intellectually, culturally, technologically. This, this state, uh, I call them um, terra nascent uh, emotions, uh, terra, uh, the earth nascent uh, connected to birth. Uh, these earth creating emotions, these positive emotions will find a place in the symbiocene and start to push out all of the negative ones. I talk about generation symbiocene. Uh, hopefully you're now part of it because you find the idea of it so exciting that you wish to be part of it. nothing other than the symbiocene from this point in your life onwards. But generation symbiocene will build the symbiocene as, as, an, uh, as an object, if you like. And then solastalgia becomes a distant memory. And I, uh, I, I write at the end of the book that the dictionaries will consider removing that word from their e-pages because they become redundant. Nobody has a reason to use it any longer. So I think the best thing that I could contribute would be a, a, a different worldview, which requires the destruction of the very word that I created in 2003. So that's, that's that. So, is it likely? Well, I have, uh, this is a school strike uh, for climate in Newcastle, the closest city to where I live. And the school kids before COVID were incredibly active and, and motivated to get out and, and uh, of the class and demonstrate where they want their future to be. And of course, in the United States, maybe not so much, but Extinction Rebellion in Australia and the UK is doing pretty well. Um, I mentioned one other thing, which is for the literary students, and that is you can actually begin to apply the ideas of the symbiocene uh, and the symbios to uh, analyze what is going on in literature. Uh, this is in Earth Emotions and you'll have the slides, so I'm not gonna talk about it in any detail, but I wanted you to start thinking about the idea that there are principles uh, of criticism in the positive sense of criticism, I don't mean it in any negative way, uh, where you can begin to evaluate uh, how an author is using uh, a plot or characters uh, to illustrate aspects of this relationship uh, between the built or natural environment and our emotional states that are part of the story of solastalgia and part of a story of how we would overcome solastalgia. So I'll, I'll leave you uh, to think about that later or for questions.
uh, as I said before, there's endless creativity involved in this process as well. Um, there are people like Kathy Fitzgerald in Ireland who are already developing almost like whole courses based around building the symbiocene. There's another one um, in Greece that's underway. Um, that's my son's cello at Wallaby Farm, propped up against a, a spotted gum or euca eucalyptus tree. Um, music is another obvious domain where uh, music in the symbiocene is an empty space that needs to be filled. And so that's my conclusion is goodbye, Solastalgia. Welcome to the symbiocene. So I, I finally get to destroy that which I created right at the very end. So thank you very much for your patience. And I'm very open to questions for people who, who still have the energy to, uh, to, uh, to ask them. Thank you so much, Glenn. Um, so I see, uh, Anna, you have your hand up and I'll invite everyone else if you wanna raise your digital hand or <laughs> post your question in the chat. Um, I'll just read them out loud if you don't wanna uh, read your questions, please. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you, Jose, for organizing this. Um, I have a question a little bit about the transition between the two concepts um, that you gave us here. Um, so my question is a little bit about, so Solastalgia, you sort of looked at, or you interviewed, it sounds like people who were proximate, who were sort of living proximate to the minds and were having these negative experiences. Um, I'm wondering a little bit about and then it seems like your the photos that you took, and then also the documentaries that you talked about, um, like create this ability, like you said, to sort of look at things that we'd rather not look at, or which we may not have been able to look at in the past, right? But I'm thinking about um, people who do look at them every day. So for example, the workers in the coal mines in Western Australia, um, or people who plan these kinds of projects, right? And have a sense of what they're going to do and have an investment in them that is potentially not just limited to their like economic life and their, but, but may have to do with their sense of progress and culture and, and maybe a kind of emotional attachment to the earth in a different way. Um, so I'm wondering about um, those, that emotional investment, the, the emotional investment that is there, we can't say it's not because it keeps going on, right? In, um, in extraction, in sort of taking resources out of the earth. So what happens to those people or those kinds of emotions um, in, in the move to the symbiocene? Look, it's a, uh, an area of ongoing investigation. At the time I was doing the interviews with my colleagues, we actually interviewed a number of people who were working for the coal mines, of course, under anonymity. That they had to sort of come in like uh, through the back door of a hall in order not to be seen by anyone uh, in our, our place of interview. One of them was a guy that drove the electric shovels, you know, so he had the levers of one of the biggest machines in the world. And he came to express the fact that he had this uh, schizophrenic relationship to his job. He said that he felt... Um, and it's a word that's well used in the upper hunter for the people who work in the coal mines. He felt handcuffed to his job. They're called the golden handcuffs because the salaries these people command are huge. In Australian dollars, uh, in back in the time when we were doing the interviews, uh, in excess of 100,000 Australian dollars was not an unusual salary to have if you're uh, a key worker in one of those mines. The golden handcuffs uh, tied him to mortgages. He had a big boat. He had a big four wheel drive. Uh, his kids went to school uh, elsewhere, uh, away from the town closest to the, uh, to the mine site because uh, his kids all had asthma and the asthma was coming from the mining and the power stations. So he said that he felt that the health impact of his work uh, on his own children was sufficient for him to have the schizophrenic feeling. Plus, every time he dug into the earth, he was feeling a greater and greater sense that 
there was some wrong being conducted. But because of the golden handcuffs, he couldn't move. He felt uh, this tension in his, his body and his mind. So he, he was a good example of someone caught between uh, the poles of what I call Terranacea and Terrafora. Terrafora are earth destroyers, Terranacea are the earth creators. So he was working his best to look after his family. <clears throat> his job was socially acceptable uh, in these uh, towns in the, in the Hunter Valley. Uh, and so it captured precisely the point that I think you were trying to make. Uh, now, it's still uh, a, a source of massive tension. Peoples whose jobs are, are tied to the extraction of coal in the Upper Hunter are clearly hostile to what would we call it environmentalism uh, writ large. They're extremely hostile to the fact that coal mines are now um, um, at risk of closing because power stations, coal-fired power stations are closing as well. Why? Because the alternatives, the renewable energy alternatives are providing cheaper uh, um, power. It's, most people don't seem to care that it's power that's also less damaging to the local environment and the global climate. But the fact that it's cheaper is a winner. So we're in this strange situation now where uh, our state and federal government are trying to uh, politicize uh, the removal of coal from our economy. They always have done, but it's now becoming really intense. And it's directly hinging on the votes of people like my uh, electric shovel driver. Will he or she go in the direction of the health of his children and the health of the earth? Or will he or she go in the direction of the golden handcuffs? Well, that's pretty much the state of the earth at the moment, isn't it? We're all caught by the golden handcuffs in some form or another. He just happened to be right at the, you know, the cutting edge to almost use the pun of, of what's going on in the minds and lives of people. So nostalgia is like built into the way that we live now. You can't consume anything without it destroying something that is also uh, emotionally uh, distressing. Uh, so this is the, the, the dilemma of the Anthropocene. Um, and my, my way out of it seems idealistic, but I would argue that what's idealistic is that we can continue this golden handcuff extractive mentality for much longer into the future without it destroying ourselves and most of life on this planet. So I agree with the catastrophists and the eco-apocalyptic people that uh, as the old Chinese saying goes, if we don't change soon, we'll get where we're going. So yes, change is necessary. I'm providing uh, an outline of a change, uh, an idea which is suggesting that, look, rather than just protest about what's going wrong, let's invent a desirable future and work towards it. That's a much better tactic than just saying, well, it, it, we're, we're all stuffed. Uh, we might as well just give up and have the extra glass of red wine or worse. So it's an important question that you've asked. The answer is uh, enormously long and convoluted, but uh, I think the, the dragline crane driver, when interviewed, uh, I could see the emotion in his uh, expression. Uh, it wasn't just what he was saying. He was visibly and viscerally shaken by the fact that he felt that his work was not only destroying the quality of life of his children, but it had wider implications. He wasn't fully aware of the implications of climate coalescence, climate warming, um, but he, he was of a sufficient sensitivity to, to really uh, to be thinking about it deeply, not just superficially. Now, he may have been unusual in the world of uh, electric shovel operators. I don't know. I only got to interview one. But uh, I was shaken by the fact that he was so fully aware of the schizophrenic nature of his life. Next. Are other, yeah, other questions? I'm ready. Cindy? 
Um, so I had a different question that I was formulating, but I think maybe they relate. So related to what you were just saying, something that I've been thinking about is this thing of the particular tragedy of people being complicit in their own environmental destruction, largely because of economic needs. So, you know, you were talking about this particular region. I'm also thinking about wildfires in the West Coast of the US, which is where I'm from, and how so many of the communities there that now have to flee, you know, they had no other choice but to be part of the industries that were cutting down the forests and creating the conditions that created, you know, now are now underlie the catastrophe. The other place that I see it similar is that I, um, most of my research has been in Palestine and I worked with a lot of Palestinians who their only job was to build settlements in Palestine, Israeli settlements that Palestinians couldn't live in. And then the landscape was all, the landscape that used to be theirs, what they were every day going to work and destroying that landscape, turning it into someone else's. So I guess I'm wondering, thinking about that particular kind of grief, how you see maybe the role of, of grief and meaning making and sort of accountability as people then shift to this other sort of dawn where we could actually see some hope? Well, I, I think a lot about uh, cognate concepts uh, like grief with, in, in relation to solastalgia. And there certainly is an element of grief in solastalgia. Places are lost. There's no doubt about it. And people grieve about things that are lost. I think it's connected to the literal meaning of grief, which, uh, at least in the English language traditions that I'm familiar with, it's most comfortably connected to uh, the loss of the intimate contact you have with another person or persons when they when they die, the the the, the sudden cessation of that which was part of your normal everyday life, is what grief as a concept attempts to uh, to convey. Uh, I, I see grief as connected to extinction. But as you would have guessed from my um, discussion of solastalgia, I see solastalgia as having an element of topophilia in it, which is the love of place. You can't have one without the other. So it's, it's not a binary, it's a, it's a spectrum. So if you've got an element of topophilia within you, it's possible that you could repair, restore a place even to the point where some of the things that are lost are, are sort of almost within the realm of, of extinction, lost forever. But that doesn't stop you rebuilding something that can restore your feelings of topophilia, to restore that which was taken away, because it's an emotional experience. It's not tied necessarily to a specific biophysical place or condition. You know, the arrow of thermodynamics, you can't go backwards in time anyway. It doesn't matter what place, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, you can't recreate the past exactly. So that can either be seen as a tragedy or as an opportunity to create something which um, out of, say, desolation, say, that, you know, there's a, a, a quarry or a, a ruined place Somebody decides, look, I'm going to uh, repair this place. I'm going to plant a million trees. And in 20 years' time, it's going to be full of birds and a place of beauty and a place where solastalgia is not relevant any longer. So solastalgia is political in the sense that the conditions which uh, destroy can also be addressed and the creative, the symbiocene aspects can, can be brought to bear. So... I've been critical of people, you know, critical in the sense of just um, asking people to think again about the, the use of the word grief, because putting the word grief next to everything, like eco grief or uh, climate grief, doesn't, to me, explain anything. Uh, and, and although I don't like Jordan Peterson, he's made, he made a reasonably good point in saying that in a sense, the climate doesn't exist. It's a hyper object, as Morton and, and others have described. It's, it's such a big dispersed thing that we can't actually have a personal relationship with it that would engage a formal concept of grief. 
So the idea that it's gone and we can never get it back puts you into a mental state that suggests that we're 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 doomed as a species. You know, like we're we're unable to create a symbiocene alternative to the apocalypse. Well, I'm not ready to give up on that idea just yet. I'd, I'd, I'd hate to think that people like Peterson might be right on something, but you never know. <laughs> the, with respect to the use of our language and, and its power to, uh, to give a sense of, uh, of optimism versus a sense of defeat is something that I pay attention to. And as a, again, it's the grandfather in me that says, I'm not going to give up on this discussion. Extinction is bad and I'll fight it. But so far, there's only been one animal on the earth that's gone extinct as, as a result of climate warming. And that's a small marsupial on an island in the Torres Strait of Australia. Well, I feel grief about that, but it's uh, nowhere near as powerful as the grief that I feel for the, for the now nearly 1 million people that have died of COVID in the United States of America alone. So, you know, there's some degree of proportionality required here. Grief is a powerful word, and I don't wish to use it in contexts where it's being diminished. Where it is relevant and where it is a, an important contribution to our, our, our emotional and psychological understanding of things, by all means, bring it in. Uh, but I'm just ultra cautious about it because it's so intimately connected to a defeatist attitude that we may as well just give up. There's nothing we can do about the future. We don't have any idea about a better future. So we may as well, you know, buy an island somewhere, build a concrete bunker, a few machine guns and some tin beans and just wait for the end of the earth. Well, bugger that. <laughs> so that's my answer to grief. Thank you. Um, so th there were a few questions in the chat earlier sent to me by, by Grace, um, and I'll just read one of them. If there are any others, maybe we have time for one more after. Um, just picking one. To, to what extent, if at all, do you think it's productive to distinguish between celestalgia caused by long-term processes uh, as opposed to celestalgia caused by an isolated traumatic event that transforms the loved environment? So something sudden as opposed to something long-term. Yeah, look, I've thought about that. Uh, I created the term Tierra trauma for the traumatic in the here and now. Trauma is a word that seems more closely aligned to this instant. The tree that you love has been cut down in front of you by the chainsaw gang or some other event occurs, which is uh, acute. And so I've always tried to align solastalgia to chronic uh, changes to the environment. So clearly mining is a chronic uh, forcing. It's 24-7, 365 days a year. It goes for 30, 40 uh, or more years. So that's where solastalgia was originally um, created to, to, to sit with those chronic change agents. At the acute ones, I mean, I write about them a lot and I feel that at times even there are virtual uh, types of solastalgia where something is happening elsewhere in the world. I don't have direct experience of it, but I have virtual experience of it. In the 21st century, what's the difference now between the real and the virtual? Uh, the, the acute processes, I think, deserve uh, a nuance of their own. Solastalgia, because we didn't have any uh, other terms in the English language when I first started, uh, I thought, well, uh, what, what is it that we're experiencing when your favourite tree is being cut down in the park right in front of you? And I thought it, there's an element of solastalgia there, but I had uh, you know, tried desperately to uh, you know, tie solastalgia to chronic change agents, even in the built environment, like gentrification is a solastalgic forcing but it's slow, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, so Tierra trauma and other negative earth emotions I think are more appropriate, but there's an element of what, the lived experience of negative environmental change is my definition of solastalgia. Seeing your favorite tree being cut down is a lived experience. It's distressing. 
it changes your mental and emotional landscape in an instant. It has to be related to solastalgia. So it's, you know, you could have acute solastalgia, you can have chronic solastalgia, but given the, the fact that I'm trying to develop this psychotheratic typology, the spectrum between the negative and the positive, it may well be that there are more appropriate terms that will come uh, over time. It's taken, you know, two decades for solastalgia to, to get to where it is. Um, the um, other people are in the trauma area are also forwarding their really well nuanced ideas about um, acute change agents and what impacts they have on uh, a person's mental well-being, their emotional well-being. So uh, it, it's a great question. Uh, if you're interested in the psychotheretic, the field is open to you. It's brand new. <laughs> You, you can do whatever you like. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Any, any takers? Okay. If, if not, um, I'd just like to thank you, Glenn, again, for this really fascinating talk and taking the time to answer these questions. Um, and I think most importantly for this, you know, very optimistic and, and hopeful view of things that you're, you're sharing and contributing in this conversation. So thank you again. My, my pleasure. I, I hope that uh, both the negative and the positive can go with you. But uh, welcome to the symbiocene. You're in it and you'll never get out of it from now on. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, we'll chat on uh, email later. So thanks. Thank you, Jose, for.